So I work on extending human lifespans because I believe this is the most powerful way to address chronic disease. In the United States today, the two major leading causes of death are heart disease and cancer. Now, these are fundamentally very different diseases, different symptoms, different progressions, but they share the same underlying driving risk factor, which is how old you are. Now, if it were possible to address aging itself, rather than addressing these diseases one at a time, wouldn't that be much higher impact? So the average woman now in the United States lives to be 81 years of age. And scientists have estimated that if we could cure all cancer, that would only get her up to 85. That would add only four years to the average lifespan. Similarly, if we could cure all heart disease, that would only get her to 86. But for the past two decades now, we've sort of, we're starting to build this menu of interventions that can reproducibly make lice live longer. So we can make mice live about 20 to 30 percent longer. And if that translated directly to humans, that would be phenomenal. That would get the average lifespan up to 113 by targeting aging directly rather than targeting individual diseases one at a time. And what's really key, too, is this would be an additional 30 years of healthy life. So I want to distinguish now between two important concepts, lifespan and health span. Lifespan is how long you live, and health span is how long you're healthy. And right now, lifespan and health span are very different. So we, uh, she would leave to 81 here, but the average health span is only 62, and that's the age at which you get your first chronic age-related disease. And all these interventions that we have already done over and over again in mammal systems not only extend lifespan, they dramatically improve the health span. Now, you'd think that given how important uh, translating aging was and how that sort of tr transformative potential it has for medicine, we'd be pouring a lot of money into this, we'd try be trying to solve this problem. But in fact, it's dramatically underfunded uh, relative to its importance. So in particular, the NIH, which is sort of all the spending on, on research, on medical research, only about 1% of their $37 billion annual budget goes to research on bas basic mechanisms of aging. And similarly, if you look at like, all of Medicare spending as a whole, that's an even smaller number. And part of the reason for that is that aging is a very young science. So it's only been for you know, a few years that we've been able to do these things. And today I'm going to give you a brief tour on sort of the history of aging research and what we're discovering now that's going to translate into human health uh, in the near future. So as I said, aging was a young science, and until the 1990s, even in academia, very few people worked on it. And the idea was that aging is so complicated, there are so many different things going wrong as you get older. How could you possibly do one simple thing and have a dramatic effect on lifespan? Is that even possible? And that sort of idea changed in 1993 uh, when Cynthia Kenyon published this paper about this worm, C. elegans. So this worm usually only lives two weeks, and she showed that by deleting a single gene in the worm, you could double its lifespan, which was just amazing. And that sort of really brought the field to increased prominence. And the next decade, people spent sort of mapping out all the different ways you could genetically modify invertebrates, uh, like yeast, flies, and worms, and influence lifespan. And they, they identified several hundred ways you could do this. So not just one or two ways, but several hundred ways. Um, so that's great. We now have really long-lived you know, worms. Um, but what about mammals? So in the 1960s, a group of Canadian scientists sailed across the Pacific to Easter Island to study the isolated population there. And while they were there, they collected a whole bunch of soil samples and brought them back to study. And just by luck, they found that this drug, rapamycin, which was produced by one of the bacteria there, um, was really sort of bioactive and did all sorts of interesting things. And the idea that this drug could impact aging was first sort of tested uh, in like a very large study in 2009. And this is, I would consider this to be one of the first drugs shown to reproducibly extend mouse lifespan. It's a very solid result. It's been done over and over again. And basically, they gave this drug to mice starting from middle age, and it boosted their lifespan by 14% on average, and also substantially increased their health spans. They got sick at later ages, although biomarkers of disease were improved. And this is sort of like you know, last, the early 2000s is when people really started to map out all the different longevity pathways in mice. Uh, excitingly, this is one of the first sort of basic aging discoveries that's been translated into humans. So there's a company, Restore Bio, just spun out of Novartis a year ago, IPO'd earlier this year, that's taken this drug um, into humans. And they just published their phase 2B data this summer, showing that rapamycin can improve certain aspects of immunosenescence. So as you get older, your immune system doesn't work quite so well, and people who took rapamycin had 30% fewer respiratory infections. It's sort of the first proof of principle felt like a really basic aging discovery taken all the way to the clinic. 
Another really exciting discovery in aging research uh, is, is to do with senescence. So when your cells get damaged, if they get really, really damaged, either by DNA or by replicating too much, they, they senesce, which means they, they no longer function, they can no longer replicate, and they actually secrete these toxic factors that are bad for neighboring cells. And there was this hypothesis uh, in the aging field for a couple decades that if you could simply delete these cells, that would be good for the animal's aging. Again, this was first tested directly in 2011, uh, and then sort of established even more uh, in 2015. But if you could delete these cells, that could boost lifespan as much as 30 uh, percent, and health span as well. And you can see that's really apparent from this image here. So these two mice are the same age. The one on the left is a regular mouse. The one on the right is a mouse with its senescent cells deleted. And you can see the regular mouse is losing hair. Its spine is bent. It's not doing so well. And just this one simple intervention can have a really dramatic impact. And there's a company working on this as well, Unity Biotechnology, which just started their first phase one study for osteoarthritis earlier this year. So this, one of these drugs went into humans just earlier this year. The final result on aging that I want to tell you about is all about blood. So there's this really intriguing finding that factors that are circulating in blood can dramatically impact how you age. There's actually this discovery that inspired the work that we do at BioAge. So in particular, the key experiment that showed that blood could impact aging was this very sort of really kind of Frankenstein experiment where you take an old mouse and you take a young mouse and you sew them together, you surgically attach them, such that after a month, new capillaries form, they share a bloodstream, and what this means is that the old mouse is getting exposed to young blood. And it turns out this is really good for the old mouse in a lot of different ways. Uh, as you might expect, it's also really bad for the young mouse to be exposed to old blood. <laughs> because blood travels everywhere and impacts every organ system, you see sort of improvements across the board. So in particular, people have found greater skeletal muscle rejuvenation, better olfaction, a better sense of smell, and even improved neurogenesis in these old animals exposed to young blood. So really very exciting. And one of the key papers that sort of launched this field uh, was published uh, in 2005, so again, just over a decade ago. So blood works, young blood works, um, but we don't actually know what the causal factors are. Um, and that's what we're trying to do at BioAge. We're trying to enumerate, figure out what it is in blood that can have a positive impact on aging and drug that. And we take a genomics and AI approach to this problem, of course. Uh, and we, what we do is we analyze blood samples from young people and from, I'm sorry, from people who live short lives and from people who live very long lives. Specifically, we have healthy aging cohorts and we take blood samples from all of them and we really deeply interrogate those to measure everything that there is in a blood sample. So we do the metabolome, the proteome, the genome, sort of the full spectrum of things that's in a blood sample and prioritize aging targets. So to give you an example, one of the targets we're working on now is a protein that circulates in your blood. And we discovered that humans who have higher levels of this protein live longer, are less frail, and are protected from disease. Furthermore, when we injected this protein into very old mice, it improved several aspects of their health and we're now trying to drug this protein. It's really key, too, that there's not just one blood factor that impacts aging, there are many. And at BioAge, we're building out a platform to enumerate all those factors, to validate them in vivo in mouse aging models, and then to drug them. So I think now, just in the last few years, we're finally entering really the human era of aging science, which is going to be a lot more translationally relevant to human diseases. There's a couple other discoveries and sort of projects in this area that I'm very excited about that I'm just going to mention to you briefly. One is the genetics of exceptional human longevity. Uh, so this woman here, Leela Denmark, lived until she was 114 years old and practiced medicine until she was 104. So she retired 40 years later uh, than most people do, which is just amazing. So we call that a supercentenarian. And there are these sort of families that are genetically enriched for this like, outlier, sort of longevity outliers. This, this is a, I love this image. <laughs> this is uh, four siblings when they were all children, then again when they're all over 100. So I think that studying the genetics that might drive this, might explain this, is another really good practical translational way to find factors that might mo uh, modulate longevity. The final example that I want to mention is mining electronic health records and repurposing drugs. So there's a number of drugs now that we've been taking for decades, uh, and it was actually this kind of approach that led to the discovery that metformin might be an anti-aging drug. So metformin is a first-line therapy for diabetes. Millions of people have been taking it for decades. And there was a paper that came out a few years ago where they looked retrospectively and saw that, hey, those diabetics that were taking metformin for decades were protected from cancer, 
and seem to be living longer than other people. And this is a really exciting approach um, for those therapies that have that data. So just to summarize, I've told you about three different ways we've extended life so far in animals, genetic interventions, drugs, and blood. So if these all work, how long can we expect to live? How far will this get us? And the really important point is that three different therapies are already in the clinic today. So as I mentioned, there are drugs targeting senescence, metformin, and there are drugs targeting rapamycin being tested in clinical trials now. And I think that could already add 10 to 20 years of healthy lifespan. Going forward in the future, I think it's a really important point to mention that there is no hard biological limit on how long we can live. And these are a couple really fascinating examples. Bowhead whales, their, aver their average lifespan is over 200 years, so they're, they're a mammal like us. Um, and bristlecone pines, the tree, can live to be over 5,000. So that's all, and I hope that you're excited as I am about the potential of aging science to really transform medicine and improve late-life health. Thank you.